aspirations to stand. <laughs> 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 oh dear, we can't get out of it. What's your name? Uh, it's uh, such a pleasure to be in this well, town, but also in the very place where Hopkins has been. And I feel a bit like Hopkins getting this sort of warm monastery and welcome from, from everyone. And it's been such a wonderful festival, you know, starting with the art gallery, then the music, uh, you know, things that Hopkins loved himself. Uh, you know, he, he was a composer as well as uh, a poet, and he was a painter, he was a very handy watercolorist. So it's great that uh, we, we have the, the painting, and then we have the music, and then we have the words. Uh, so it's all good, really. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from my book, White Silhouette, which came out last year, um, which is kind of maybe a mixture of Hopkins and Eliot, but. Uh, not as good by a huge factor. Uh, however, as Edit says, for us there is only the trying, the rest is not our business. Which is one of my favourite mottos. <laughs> so I'm going to read just a bevy of poems, and you may be having a severe energy dip like myself. <laughs> so feel free to snooze off. Uh, <laughs> Where's your bell? <laughs> There'll be no um, cattle prods uh, around, don't worry. Uh, I know I have a sopor soporific voice, so um, I, it's one of the, uh, the uh, things I've had at poetry readings of people, <laughs> people nodding off, so please feel free to drift in the mind, okay? <laughs> um, so I'll read a bevy of poems, and I've actually asked um, Lance to read one of the poems. It's a slightly longer one, it's a type of poem, which uh, he's very uh, agreed to do. I was going to say gladly, but I don't know. <laughs> he's agreed to do it, so that'll, we'll end with that one. So, um, I'm going to start with Summer Holidays. Um, this is a kind of a secular poem. James, would you mind giving us a page? Yes, I so will. For this. those of you who want to follow the 81 in your hymn books. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a short poem about going on holiday in about 1972. And I'd just broken up from boarding school. And um, my father took us as a family to, uh, my father was, uh, I've said before, from County Vich, and he took us on a, our annual Irish pilgrimage. And we ended up in the north, in Skillen. And we actually stayed at his old school, which is called Petora, some of you may know it. It, was, it has two famous old boys, Oscar Wilde and Simon Beckett. Wow. Both playwrights, and that's it. It doesn't get better than that. It's not quite as good as Highgate, but uh, <laughs> uh, and then Betjeman and Hopkins, or oh, maybe better. Who knows? Anyway, um, it, this seemed to be like the last place I wanted to be. You know, having broken up from boarding school, and we arrive at Dad's old boarding school <laughs> after term time, and he knew the headmaster, and it was a cheap way of putting up six people, basically. <laughs> And I remember walking into the guest, ac guest accommodation, which was the sanatorium, and there were six sort of Crimean War style beds in a row. Um, and that was kind of, uh, yeah, where we, where we lived for a few days. And uh, it was a very troublesome holiday because my parents were going through a difficult period. They were late, later to divorce, in fact. So there was a sort of undercurrent throughout the holiday. So this is called the Torah Royal. We're like a troop of travelling players, the six of us rehearsing holiday royals as we motor through the Irish Midlands, the sky blending with layers of turf smoke. At Enniskillen we enter Dad's old school, out of term, deserted, a huge sepulchre, headmaster with a warm off-duty smile, showing us our rooms in the sanatorium, then guiding us like prospective parents to classrooms, dining hall, conjuring up Beckett, Valpine in his cricket flannels, 
and Oscar Wilde casting pearls to swine. While Dad slips back some 40 years, me, a mere three weeks to homesickness. Next day, a change of emptiness. Lock Urn, headmaster's boat, glare-induced smiles, islands slipping past us on the water, Dad acting the husband without a mistress, Mum, the unsuspecting wife. Next day, sickness strikes a tummy bug. And it's like a scene from Endgame. All six of us in the sanatorium, moaning like mourners, and none of us knowing that this will be our last family holiday, but all of us knowing. Mm. Ah, a few days. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to, this is another kind of a journey poem. I do a lot of journeys and sort of pilgrimage types of poem. Mm. And this is a poem about travelling from West Cork to the west of England in 2010 to have Christmas with my sister who lives in Dorset. Uh, I think it's the first time that myself, my wife and daughter, Gracie, have actually made the journey to the east. And it was the year of the great snowstorm. I don't know if you recall that. Yes. When we first moved to West Cork, we thought we'll never see snow again. <laughs> um, because of the, you know, the climate. And then this amazing snowstorm just before, about a week before we were due to leave. And so the whole, the whole of Ireland seemed to be transformed into a mystical landscape. There's something about snow, the reflecting of light, which sort of gives us a slightly uncanny feel of the greater light, I've always thought. So I tried to capture this journey try to capture the sort of the so mystical transformation of the landscape. And it's done in a series of almost like haiku, with very short little pictorial poems that the, the Japanese specialise in. So it's called The Journey East. Winter 2010, mm -hmm. page 11. The car revving up. The thrill of us wiping mist away to find a whiter world. Black ice to Clonakilty. Cortege of cars behind a spectral hearse. Strings of lights in Bandon, sapphire cold. And the stars are moving through the river. On Cork's Victorian viaduct, a train made of snow. We steam below the River Lee. Cork City crusts behind us. Three swans on slatty water. Feathery ice. The sun's last x-ray radiates the trees. Lights turn red in Castle Martin. Diesel slush road. Across the black water, Waterford has drifted white. Inching mile by mile through Iceland, Greenland, Wexford, another country. Dungarvan's glittery square, each shop an advent calendar window. Beyond the shore bridge, the dark returns. But angels are alighting on new Ross. Ross Lair night, chalet on a ghostly estate. Sound of wind and chimney. Dawn ferry, sudden vibrations. Propellers churn the sea to snow. The swells swing up and down and up. Oh, let the voyage finish now and grant us solid earth. From Pembroke, Wales unfolds in white. 
A post box in a wall, red as a berry. Below the Severn Bridge, water turned to bone. The Somerset levels crisp and even. The motorway accelerates the dark. The night re-icing the Yeovil Road. Not now. Not now. We're nearly there. Catty stock lumped with snow. Wood incense. Curtains edged with gold. <coughs> A house on Duck Street, an outdoor light, a star that stopped overhead. <laughs> so I wrote this, uh, this poem about the Book of Kells and about art. And uh, the first bit is, is a little pilgrimage to Iona. Has anyone been to Iona by any chance? <laughs> At least one has. <laughs> Yeah, Richard has. <laughs> um, uh, Iona, the uh, Scottish island of Iona is where uh, the Book of Kells was thought to have been begun. That's the right grammar. Uh, by Columba, St. Columba. And uh, who had a reputation as a scribe. Um, it was said that his five fingers glowed like lanterns when he was in scribal mode. You could see the glow in the scriptorium from, from afar, and you knew what he was up to. So this is just um, my arrival on Iona. Evening was slanting the boat from Mull towards Iona. A journey the echo of a shout. And I was staring at the water as deeply as a gold panner. Behind Dalriada rose and heather-lit mountains, the border of a kingdom of shadows. I came for traces of Columba and found nothing but stone in the wind-sleeted abbey, grave slabs sliding into ruin, the slaty boarding house of widow hush, netless glare. No clues on the coastal paths, or on the rhythmic Macher's hummocky grass and ferns, or at the cove of the coracle, where Columba saw, at last, that Ireland was invisible. Or on Sithin Moor's rise, where a circle of angels appeared as he prayed alone on his knees, and they caressed the air with beating wings, an oratorio of swans a lighting in a halo. Uh, there was no arts council in those days, but they had rich patrons who would give you money. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and this guy called Mycenaeus gave Horace a farm, which is rather nice, and he was able to write poetry. And Horace is really most famous for his idea of living in the now, which has now become quite prevalent, isn't it? The power of now. Everyone read that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good book, that. <laughs> Uh, the, the idea of living in the present was uh, something that Horace um, made popular. So this is called Carpe Diem, which means seize the day, which is Horace's motto, if you like. And it comes from Ode's Book 1, number 11, and it's number 85 in the book. We cannot know what fate has planned for us. So don't worry or bother reading tea leaves. God knows we could enjoy a few more winters, or maybe this one, smashing huge waves against the rocks, will be our last. Who's to say? Be wise. Relax. Enjoy a good red wine. And trim your hopes to match a life that's brief. Even as I write these words, begrudging time is slipping by. So come on, seize the day. Trusting the future is a recipe for grief. 
Some wise words from, from Morris. Very so, interested in iconoclasm, the idea of smashing art, um, uh, which I won't, can't really go into because once I start, I get too interested in it. But the, the Puritans had a, this reputation for smashing art. Um, there's a famous example of a Puritan you know, walking into Canterbury Cathedral in 1648 with a 60-foot ladder. And he walked up the ladder and he just started smashing the stained glass windows, which had been there for 300 years. And you'd think he'd be kind of like a, you know, a, a vandal, but he was um, actually a member of the Church of England and a graduate of Cambridge University. So it was a very sort of deliberate ploy. You know, it wasn't a kind of a random act of vandalism. It was carefully constructed. Uh, destruction, and it, I wanted to know why would you do that? You know, what is it about beauty that so drives you to anger? And there's a slight sense of that with uh, Caradoc cutting off um, the Nifrin's head, which I won't go into. But I remember visiting St Nicholas's Church in Galway. I don't know if anyone's been there. It's a sort of you know around the centre. Church of Ireland now. And there are two angels there with their heads cut off, courtesy of Oliver Cromwell's men, um, who also did the same in Kilkenny. So this is a little poem about, um, about that incident and the, the sort of ramifications. So it's, it's called Headless Angels. And I dedicate it for this afternoon to Richard with Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> when they saw you, Cromwell's troopers, stabling their horses in nave and choir, did they remember the angels at Mamre receiving a blessed welcome in the desert? Or Daniel's angel in his linen clothes, his loins girded with gold of Ufaz? Or the angel who rolled back the stone, face like lightning, raiment white as snow. And seeing your fiery wings made material, did they rage against the dull, heavy world? Or were they blinding any witness to their crime, concealing in the priest holes of their minds, a grain of imagination. Mm -hmm. So in a way it's a poem of failed encounters set in landscapes, but possibly with, I don't know, slightly optimistic ending in the end, I'm not sure really. But uh, anyway, uh, Lance has very kindly uh, agreed to read it. So, um, um, if you'd like to give Lance an encouragement. It's very kind and I gladly agree uh, to a great honour. They say fools rush in where angels fear to tread and I feel a little like that reading uh, James's testament as he says. I thought we would meet in a holy place, like the church in the hamlet of Bishopston, empty on a Wiltshire summer's day, the trees full of rooks and hung in green, and the stream in the meadows a rush of darkling silver beneath the bridge. Where I saw my first kingfisher flash its needle, leaving its turquoise stitch in my memory. And I would sit in the church and close my eyes and wait in vain for something to ignite and wonder whether this was my life wasting away in my mother's home. Sometimes I'd bring Herbert's temple and read the quiet order of his poems and picture him, as once he was glimpsed, hugging the floor in his church at Bemerton asking love to bid him welcome. 
I sat with an upright, praying disposition, preoccupied in self-combing, too callow and spiritually impatient to notice if you had slipped in as a tourist to inspect the choir or front and buy a picture postcard and sign the book with lovely atmosphere, or as a walker taking refuge from rain, or a woman primping flowers by the altar, or somewhere like the island of Patmos, out of season and the tourist flow, the sea leeching blue from the skies, in the cave of St. John, pointillist gold on tips of candles and highlights of icons. You might have visited that day in September when I was there, absorbing the coolness, imagining John on the day of the Lord, prostrate on the ground as if before a throne, and you, not dressed in a robe and gold sash, nor with hair as white as wool or snow, but as a pilgrim with camera and rucksack, respectful, curious, guidebook in hand, appreciating the grain of raw stone, catching my eye and pausing for a second as if I were a school friend from years ago. I never saw you if you were there for I was too blinded by the new Jerusalem, flashing out jasper, topaz, sapphire, descending from heaven like a huge regal crown. Or somewhere like Holy Cross in Tipperary, the abbey at the meeting of road and river. You might have stopped to break a journey, as I often do, and seen me there in the nave, ambling down the sloping floor towards the relic splinter of the cross, or sitting outside on the banks of the shore on a bench on a swathe of tended grass. Perhaps that day when, heading north, I paused by the car park to watch a bride, fragile and frozen by the door, her bridesmaids huddled in the cold of March, waiting and waiting to make her entrance into the sudden shine of turning faces, like a swan gliding in its snowdress from an arch of the bridge in a state of grace. I was too mesmerized by her destiny to see you start your car, drive off, and raise your hand as you passed me by on the way to Cashel for Noy and the South. But there was that time I was so certain that I had finally found you. Sick at home, I turned to meditation and prayer to overcome self-pity for weeks accumulating quietude till that morning when seconds were emptied out my thoughts cleansed, myself destroyed within an uncanny infusing light that seemed to deepen and unfold more layers of radiance and lay me wide open so you could cross the threshold or I could cross at any moment. But I closed the door of my heart. Afraid, who knows, that I might have met you. Afraid I would pass to the other side and never return to all that I knew. I thought I could always reopen myself and greet you properly, well prepared. I never did. I feared that sudden shift into the zone of timelessness. Too scared, I looked for you in public, for safety. I kneeled in churches, gave the sign of peace in St. James's Piccadilly. I recited prayers, took bread and wine, 
and I concentrated so hard, but failed to believe they were your blood and body. I heard staccato prayers like nails banged in, as if to board out windows. Sometimes I'd sense you as a glimmer, as in that dream I once had out of the blue when you stood at night on a Greek island shore. Your face was hidden, but it was you. The stars pinned in place the layers of darkness. Then came the comets, perhaps a dozen, their tails fanned out with diminishing sparks. Slowly they twisted and turned, your hands moving in concert, as if you were guiding them, as if they were on strings like Chinese kites. The comets slowed and stopped and changed into letters of Hebrew emblazoning the night. And I knew if I could grasp those words, your silent message across the stars, I'd know my destiny on earth. Instead, I woke as puzzled as Belshazzar. I do not search for you anymore. I don't know whom to seek or where. Too weary disillusioned. I'm not sure what I think, or if I really care that much. My last hope that my resignation might be a sign of the via negativa, a stage of my self-abnegation, prevents the thing it hopes for. myself, a camouflaged prayer dispatched towards the cloud of unknowing. And all I have to do is stay where I am, ready to be rescued. Not move, speak or think, but wait for the brightening of the cloud, for your white silhouette to break free from it and come nearer, nearer, till I see your essence and I can ask where in the world you were throughout my days. And only then will I grasp why I never found you, because you were too close to home, because I thought I'd have to die to see you there, right there removing the lineaments of your disguise. My careworn, wrinkled skin. My jaded incarnation of your eyes. My face becoming your face. My eyes, your eyes. I, you. Us, I, you, us, I, yes.